Hey, James. Hmm? What? It's time to do the review. Come on. Oh. Uh. Okay, cool. Let's, uh. Let's get started then. Uh. Wait, it's. It's that easy? You're just. You're just doing it? Well. What did you want me to do? Do you want me to cry and scream, no, 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 while you drag me away and force me to, to do the review? Because. That seems kind of. overplayed by this point, don't you think? I mean. That's been around ever since YouTube has been a thing. I, I mean, I just thought you'd put up more resistance than that. I, did you want to just do some cringy sketch where I got a couple of people together and came up with this bizarre way of explaining how bad this book was before I even started the review? Because, I mean, I, I don't even have two people to work with this, okay? We're not two people talking. This is just me talking to myself, but I cut it together in editing so it looks like two people. Uh... Matter of fact, I didn't even change my shirt for your half, okay? I just put a jacket on over it. That's how lazy I'm being right now. I, I mean, at the end of the day, it's just a book. It's not that bad, and it seems kind of cringy to just play it up like that to make it seem like it's ending my life and make me want to kill myself, don't you think? Well, look, do you, do you want to get started or not? Well, yeah, I'd love to get started right away, but I filmed this half first. I have to wait for you to go. Oh. Uh, this is True Allegiance by Ben Shapiro. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. So, Ben Shapiro. For, for those of you who aren't familiar with him, uh, I envy you because he is an extremely right-wing political commentator who is known for things like advocating the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians, uh, claiming that if schools teach his children about LGBT people, he's going to shoot somebody, claiming that the US military should be allowed to kill civilians, uh, having a bizarre obsession with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and being a climate change denier. Uh, just overall, he's kind of a piece of shit. And um, I would go into a lot more detail about that, but honestly, I don't want to that much, and honestly, this one clip kind of encapsulates how shitty he is much better than I could ever hope to. So let's say, let's say, for the sake of argument, that all of the water levels around the world rise by, by let's say, five feet. And it puts all the low-lying areas on the coast underwater. Right, which, let, let's say all of that happens. You think that people aren't going to just sell their homes and move? Just one small problem! Sell their houses to who, Ben? Fucking Aquaman! Now, a lot of you have probably already seen that, and normally I wouldn't play other people's content like that, but I just, I feel like H-Bomber guy just said it so much more succinctly than I ever could, so go check out that video in his channel if you haven't. But, uh, you know, the point is, at one point, Ben Shapiro wrote a book. It's called True Allegiance, and it's not very good. So here's the summary. America is coming apart. An illegal immigration crisis has broken out along America's southern border. There are race riots in Detroit. A fiery female rancher turned militia leader has vowed revenge on the president for his arrogant policies and the world's most notorious terrorist is planning a massive attack that could destroy the United States as we know it. Meanwhile, the president is too consumed by legacy-seeking to see our country's deep peril. Brett Hawthorne is the youngest general in the United States Army, and he's stuck, alone, behind enemy lines in Afghanistan. He's the last lost soldier of a failed war, fighting to stay alive and make it back home. But will he be able to stop the collapse of America in time? So from that, you can pretty clearly tell that yeah, this is meant to be some sort of uh, contemporary thriller story, okay? There's going to be, like, political intrigue, there's going to be spy stuff, there's going to be action. It's not that hard to figure it out, and that is definitely what this book tries to do. Um, it also tries to be propaganda, and it's not particularly good at it, but, you know, we'll get into that as it goes on. I think we've done enough, so let's just, let's just start reading. Let's go to the prologue. New York City. By the time Jennifer Collier hit the George Washington Bridge, it was already almost 9 a.m. rush hour. The bridge had turned into an enormous parking lot. Jennifer looked out at the sea of red lights before her, stretching all the way into New York and sighed. There had to be 30,000 cars on this bridge, all of them moving two miles an hour. Jennifer glanced at her watch and sighed. She was on the west side of the bridge, and she could see its two enormous steel encased towers looming before her. In her passenger seat, her daughter Julie breathed softly, sleeping. Jennifer glanced at her watch again. 9.03. Come on, she muttered, which is when she heard it. The bridge groaned. 
It was a loud, low groan that made the car vibrate. Julie woke up. What was that? she asked drowsily. The groan died away. Nothing, said Jennifer. Probably just a plane overhead. Go back to sleep. Mommy. The bridge groaned again. This time it was longer, more drawn out. Jennifer felt the brake pedal vibrate beneath her foot. Mommy, that's not a plane, said Julie, wide awake now. The groaning continued, booming from beneath them. The bridge was undulating slightly up and down now. Julie could see the cables of the suspension bridge, oscillating like the strings of a guitar. Mommy, what's going on? Julia cried. Cars ahead were honking now, urgently pleading for those at the front of the bridge to hurry up. A few cars were trying to ram their way through the traffic, pushing other cars towards the edge of the bridge. The honking and crashing, combined with the burgeoning low roar, made Jennifer's headache pound, the driving rhythm of her blood surging through her temples. It was kind of confusing to read, but okay. Then the bridge's roar stopped again. The people ahead of Jennifer kept honking, panicking, trying to get off the bridge. After about 30 seconds, the honking seemed to die down a little bit. Julie's wide eyes grew wider. She was staring at a crash on the other side of the divider, the flames leaping from the engine of a smashed Toyota. Jennifer could see a man's arms hanging, lifeless, out the window. Jennifer reached up and gripped Julie's arm. It's okay, baby, she whispered, wetting her lips. So, quick question there. If this, if the cars are packed bumper to bumper, how did, how is there enough room to have a crash that bad? Because normally, for a crash that bad, you have to be going fairly fast? Okay. Then time seemed to stop. The noise of the traffic went silent. Jennifer's eyes opened in horror. The bridge before Jennifer tilted sideways. The 604-foot tower before her began to lean, almost gracefully, to her right. Jennifer screamed, but it was drowned out in the ear-splitting cracking noise. Hundreds of thousands of tons of steel twisting and bending and grating on each other. The sound of a million airplanes all crashing at once. Julie, er, uh, Jennifer looked to her left as she heard the steel cable shriek, stretch on the other side of the bridge. She locked eyes with an elderly man driving a silver Lincoln Continental. Behind him, she saw one of the enormous metal cables snap clean and slither wildly back and forth, like a beginning fly fisherman's messy cast. Look out, she shouted at the man. He couldn't hear her, but he turned to follow her eyes. The cable ripped through the Lincoln, slicing its occupants in half vertically, a jet, of a jet stream of red following in its wake, splattering Jennifer's windshield. In front of her, the road itself began to tilt. Cars slid horizontally towards the railings, bath-time playthings of an angry god. So yeah, it goes on like that for a little bit longer. Basically, there was a big terrorist attack, destroyed the whole bridge, a bunch of people died, and we don't know exactly what's happening. Now, this is a pretty amateurish mistake uh, to do at the beginning of your book, because a lot of people here start your book off with a bang, start it with something to get your audience invested, and they immediately assume, okay, action sequence, but well, it's kind of hard to care about that if it's with characters that we haven't seen before. And in this particular instance, Jennifer and her daughter die, so we never see them again. And it's like, well, are, are we supposed to care that much? Because we really don't. And in fact, uh, the book flashes back after this, because it goes to part one, which is before the attack, and then later the attack will happen and the story will move on past that, but it's kind of hard to care about the attack at all when nobody that we know or care about as readers died during it, or was hurt during it, and no, none of their loved ones died during it either. So, like, right off the bat, this is very amateurish, and that's not even getting into the shitty writing itself, like all the various metaphors that he uses. It, it's just it's just clumsy and clunky. So now we start off again in chapter one with another action sequence. Brett, Kabul, Afghanistan. Brigadier General Brett Hawthorne looked at his M9 magazine and cursed to himself, empty. He was sat up against a mud brick hovel in the city's poor part of town. Even in Kabul, there was a large income gap and felt the sweat trickle down cold between his shoulder blades. He hadn't been alone for years. Generals always had a personal security detail, but things had gone hellishly wrong. Hawthorne was a bear of a man, 6'3 in his bare feet and 215 pounds in his underwear, with a gray and blonde crew cut and a face carved of granite. But he had pr plenty of smile lines, he just didn't like showing those to people unless he knew them. So, those of you who don't know, Ben Shapiro is short. And I wouldn't normally make fun of him for that, partially because I'm not a big dude either, like, I'm taller than him, but, like, I'm, I'm still a pretty small guy, and partially because, like, it's just a bit mean-spirited to make fun of something, someone for something that they can't help like that. Uh, but one, Ben Shapiro's a piece of shit, and I don't feel bad about 
anything I say about him. And two, he clearly has a complex about it. Uh, so I'm gonna start a counter. Every time that a character is introduced as being big, we're gonna put it on screen. So rather than trying to get us invested in that action sequence which we were just introduced to, the book instead goes into a very long flashback where it just explains Brett's entire life. Like, literally from the moment he was a kid, up through his school years, him joining the military, meeting his wife, his whole career up until this point, which kind of went to shit, and that's why he was here. And then it goes into the specifics of the day before, where there was an attack, and that's why he's in this current position. Uh, but I do have to talk about his, uh, his backstory a little bit, because for the most part it's just kind of like standard thriller shit. Like, okay, he's just... He's just a uh, ultra badass, normally. But in this case, there's a couple of dumb things. Like, for starters, it has an introduction with him and his friend Derek. And it says, Derek taught him how to talk his way out of situations. And the thing is that it happened because the, he went to an all-black school in uh, middle school or high school. I don't care enough to check. Uh, and this other really big black kid thought that uh, Brett called him the N-word, which I'm not going to repeat it on camera, but I get the feeling that Ben had a real, just way too much fun typing it down. But anyways, he thinks he called him that, and then Derek, who is also black, came up and just acted like a fucking weirdo and started singing, and then the other guy backed off, which... I don't see how that taught Brett how to talk his way out of situations. And you would also think that by bringing it up, it would become important to the story later. And it doesn't. And then it goes into how he met his wife. On one of his rare off days, Brett found himself at Charleston's bustling city market. The shops were heavy with traffic. Rain outside had forced everyone into the covered complex of artists hawking their pictures and crafts. He was wearing his Citadel uniform, standing out conspicuously among the women in their summer dresses and the men in their jeans and seersucker sport coats. Reluctant to run back out into the rain, he leaned against a bookcase. No loitering, cadet. The voice was musical. For some reason, the image of a woodwind came to mind. A southern woodwind, since her accent sang of long summers and lemonade. <laughs> now, I know it's not uncommon for male writers to write women as being attractive, and they do it in kind of a cringy way, but nonetheless, that's particularly dumb. So then it goes through his uh, military career, and it says, By Kosovo, he was a captain. On September 11th, he was a major. A major who, by simple coincidence, knew Pashto. Which, for those of you who don't know, that's a language which is fairly commonly spoken in Afghanistan. But we don't get any other explanation for how he learned Pashto. Like, it doesn't say he knew somebody and he learned from them. It doesn't say, like, he thought that Afghanistan was going to be a trouble spot, so he purposely went out of his way to learn it. It, it doesn't say anything like that. He just knows Pashto. And, granted, sometimes you just pick up shit like that. But for languages, I could believe it if it was something fairly commonly spoken in the U.S. Like, if, if he learned Spanish, because, like, he lives in Texas, so if he had just learned Spanish by osmosis, I'd find that very believable. And if he learned something like, I don't know, German or Italian or French, those are also, like, fairly common, so it wouldn't be that weird for him to know it, but... Pashto? Really? He, he just knows that. So then it goes into how Brett thinks that the president screwed up the war. The deal for the military bases was all but dead. The administration was scrambling. The Afghan president, in an attempt to appease his inflamed population, demanded that U.S. troops change their rules of engagement to avoid civilian casualties, in the process endangering more American soldiers. See, that's a very interesting line to me, because, as I said, Ben Shapiro has publicly said in real life that he thinks the U.S. military shouldn't have to worry about civilian casualties, and that he doesn't give a shit if we kill Afghani civilians. So, this is him just straight up saying that in the book's universe as well, the other characters not only agree with him, but his way of looking at things is the correct way of doing things. Like, apparently it's smart to kill civilians, because, you know, that's not a great recruiting tool for the Taliban or anything. Just... 
cool. So then it has this weird moment where, like, he's showing a camera crew from CNN around, and they have to specify that it's from CNN because those guys aren't explicitly right-wing and therefore their opinions are all bad, but, uh, basically, <laughs> there, he's showing some camera crew around, and then a child strapped to a donkey with a bomb on it uh, comes up near them, and the Taliban is nearby about to set it off, and Brett saves the day by pulling out his handgun and shooting the cell phone which was going to set off the bomb, which disables it, and then saving the kid from the donkey. So he's just, you know, a big damn hero. And that part... Look, I get that this is a thriller and that the main character is supposed to be a major badass. Like, I'm not... I don't have a huge issue with that. It's just that it's such a bizarre and stupid way of showing it that it's just kind of funny. So then we finally get to an explanation about how and why Brett was in the situation we found him at the beginning. And basically, it turns out that uh, the U.S. military is pulling out of Afghanistan, like, you know, they want to all be gone soon, and so the Taliban stages a big attack when there's not many of them left and they're all weak. And basically, like, they have an attack and then they send a car bomb in and blow a bunch of people up and then they wait for people to come in and help them and then they blow it up again. And this whole thing, it's meticulously well planned for the Taliban, which is, you know, not that unbelievable, I don't think. But then it also shows that a pretty huge portion of the Afghani population is apparently on their side and that they also want the U.S. military gone. And so it just seems to me that, like, why would you bother sticking around if that's the case? Because, like, you're clearly not ever going to get it into a situation where the Afghani government can stand against the Taliban on its own and be a U.S. ally. So it seems like you're just send sending all these people over to die and using up all this money and equipment just to try and prop up a puppet regime. And this isn't even really what I think about the real world. This is what the book is showing off. Okay. So yeah, the Taliban take over the U.S. Uh, embassy, the ambassador gets evacuated, a bunch of the men get evacuated, and then a bunch more of them get killed, and Brett gets separated, and that's how we meet him, but that's also how we leave him. That's the end of the first chapter. So, we started an action sequence, we went away from it, went through this whole long flashback explaining this man's entire life and why we should agree with him, because he has the right politics, and then... It just ends. I guess it's supposed to be a cliffhanger, but it's not a very good one. So then we get our introduction to President Prescott in Washington, D.C. We simply can't pay for it, sir. White House Chief of Staff Tommy Bradley was standing over the President's desk in the Oval Office, a sheaf of budget papers in his hand. Crumpled, wrinkled papers covered in red notes. The numbers just didn't add up. And President Mark Prescott didn't care. Listen to me, Tommy, said the President. My re-election relies on our ability to secure funding for this action. You know that. I know that. The polls show it. We don't have a choice in the matter. Tommy gritted his teeth. He knew Prescott was right. The president had been dropping precipitously in the polls. His critics blamed his policies for widespread inflation and unemployment. Prescott was deathly afraid of becoming Jimmy Carter, and he was right on the precipice of having his worst fears realized. When Mark Prescott ran for president, he didn't know what he'd be inheriting. He was no babe in the woods. He was a hardened ideologue a product of the Chicago machine, the hand-picked protege of the power brokers. But he hadn't quite contemplated the nature of the country he'd be handed once elected. Okay, so, that whole thing about the power brokers, that never gets brought up again. But I find it interesting, because it's like, Ben is admitting that there are people who work behind the scenes to try and influence American elections. Like, even if it is on paper at least, a democracy, there's a lot of shit that works against that. And I just want you to remember that he talks about the power brokers, and just keep that in mind as it goes on, because it, like, it makes Prescott and his ilk seem like the bad guys, but seriously, just, just remember. So then it explains how Prescott is trying to help the country because it's in a 
deep economic spiral down. It's not doing good. And so he's trying to make a big uh, program that will, or actually he's done a lot of different programs, but he's trying to make a big one which will like, yeah, say, hey, let's put Americans to work, build a bunch of roads and shit. And then it says, big men, Prescott knew, required big governments, and big governments required big spending. Because, you know, why not throw in some more buzzwords? And then as he's explaining it, he decides it'll be called the Work Freedom Program. Prescott's Work Freedom Program. Everyone recognized the value of freedom, but what did that mean other than the right to a job? Freedom meant nothing if you couldn't put bread in your children's mouths at night, and America was a country of workers. Freedom was work, and work was freedom. Work, freedom. Simple. Easy. Repeatable. Genius. You're really fucking subtle, Ben. You know, just compare all of your political opponents to Nazis. I'm sure that's something you're okay with when they do it to you. And then Prescott is, like, going on camera and explaining it to, you know, the American people. And I'm sorry if I'm jumping around a bit, but there is a lot of, like, littler bits of info in the middle that I don't really have time to get into. But he says, I know, he said wearily, that some of my political opponents would like to call this plan irresponsible. I know they sling around words like socialism, he framed the word with his fingers, and Marxism, and redistributionism, and they hope to scare you with those words. And I find that fascinating because that is the first, not the last in this book by a fair margin, but the first point where a character says something fairly reasonable, but it's framed as though they're saying something crazy. Like, he's saying that his political opponents just use socialism and Marxism and all that to describe anything they don't like, and yeah, that's kind of what happens. So Prescott finishes telling everybody about that, and then we go to the next chapter, which introduces another character. And, like, I know Ben was trying to write this, like, sprawling political thriller. Like, he was trying to write this huge story which has a whole bunch of different angles to it that intersect and interconnect in interesting ways, but you're not George W. R. Martin, okay? You, you can't do that. George W. R. Martin can't even really do that very well. It, it takes a very skilled author to be able to pull that sort of thing off, and you're not, because throughout the majority of this, a lot of these characters are just doing their own thing, and it does come together at the end, but in a very unsatisfying way that could have been handled some other way. And I'm realizing that this is a pretty short book. Uh, most copies are 272 pages. Uh, the one I'm reading on here is a little bit longer, but that's because it's, you know, on phone, smaller screen, whatever. But, and then I'm realizing that's pretty short, and he probably just needed to fill up space, because he didn't have much plot. So this new character is named Soledad, Central Valley, California. The SWAT team didn't expect the first time she brought them cookies. Nobody brings the SWAT team cookies. Do, do I even need to keep going? Like, I feel like those two sentences sum up how shitty the writing is in this. Uh, so, I, I honestly find Soledad's parts of this book the most, uh, well, boring, for lack of a better word. Like, I, I don't like using that too much because it, it doesn't say much, but yeah, it, her parts are just really boring. So basically, she's just a rancher in California, uh, her water supply got cut off by the EPA because they're trying to protect fish, and she had to basically let one of her workers go, or all of her workers really, but there's one in particular that the book focuses on named Emilio, and Emilio had a son named Juan, and then they had to move to Los Angeles where he got a different job, and then Juan got killed by some gang members, and so Soledad blames the government for... Juan being dead, and for her not being able to pay her bills, and all that, and so, basically, long story short, she builds a bomb, and then sets it off in front of the EPA's offices in California, so one of the major characters of this book is a terrorist, and it goes to great lengths trying to say, like, oh no, she did it when nobody was there, so nobody got hurt or anything, like, there's no way to guarantee that. You very well could have killed a lot of people doing this. But it just tries to reassure us, no, no, she's not a terrorist. She was forced into this by the government. And the problem is, I'm pretty sure the Taliban felt the exact same way. I'm pretty sure the people who blow up that bridge feel the exact same way. But 
I guess they're fighting for political beliefs that Ben Shapiro disagrees with, so they're bad. But Soledad is fighting for political beliefs that Ben agrees with, so she's good. And again, it goes to great lengths to explain, no, no, she's not a terrorist. Fuck you. And anyways, basically, her house gets surrounded by SWAT team, but then a couple hundred militia members show up and surround the SWAT team, and so they wind up not arresting her, and so she just brings them cookies and shit. And uh, that's basically it for this chapter. It's very boring. And then we go to another character named Levon in Detroit. And he's a black guy who runs a barbershop, but he also runs a racketeering ring because, you know, obviously if you're black and live in Detroit, you're a criminal. Uh, Levon is talking to another man named Big Jim Crawford, who is like this, you know, black leader, I guess, a black community leader. Like, he talks at protests and stuff. I don't know. It just they, they don't really explain it that well. But anyways, now Crawford looked confused. Levon's smile never faltered. It's Shakespeare, he said. It means you'll learn to trust me. Crawford laughed, loudly this time. Then he looked at Levon curiously. Quoting dead honkies, he twinkled. You might be useful yet. Ben, I mean this sincerely. Have you ever in your life met a black person? So then a cop named O'Sullivan uh, is walking around the city at night and he finds a black kid and he's like, hey kid, what are you doing? And the kid is like, fuck you, honky, get the fuck out of my neighborhood. You, you know, calls him a white boy, all that shit. Again, Ben, have you ever met a black person? They, they don't talk like that. But anyways, um, yeah, and kid has a toy gun and cop shoots him and kills him. And apparently this was all set up by Levon in order to spark a conflict. He, he was set up to make people angry. And the thing is that there is security footage of this, which shows it at just the proper angle so you can't see that the kid did reach for his fake gun and that the cop just shot him. And we as the audience know that the kid was reaching for the fake gun, but the rest of the world doesn't, okay? So as this goes on, I know I keep saying this, but as this goes on, I really want you to keep in mind that from their point of view, the cop just shot the kid for really no reason. Even in the land of make-believe, where Ben can control everything that happens, he still accidentally winds up reinforcing the belief of a trigger-happy murderous cop. It's just, it's kind of beautiful. So then we go to another character, but this one we already sort of had introduced to us. This one was named Ellen, and she is Brett's wife. And she lives in Texas, and she works for the governor of Texas. Specifically, she works for Border Patrol. Well, she doesn't work for Border Patrol, but she's working a lot with them at this point in time. So it starts off with several pages of her just kind of whining about how the border is open now because the president told them not to deport unaccompanied minors, which automatically equals crime. Like, that's weird because it says, don't deport unaccompanied minors, and then it immediately goes to, okay, yes, so there's drugs and rape and all that coming over the border now, and there's no way to stop it, which is dumb. I don't know. And then her and her friend are driving along, and a helicopter is stopped in the middle of the road, in the middle of nowhere. And apparently it's a bunch of cartel members, and they just start screaming at her in Spanish. Still, she didn't move. Ellen had time for one thought. Oh shit, before the Mexican pointed the carbine at the truck and fired a burst through the windshield. The first bullet missed Vivian, but the second caught her directly in the face. Her head slammed back against the seat rest, the back of her head splattering. One moment her pretty face was staring directly at Ellen, the next there was no face, just a mess of tissue and tendon and bone and blood. But what about the third bullet? Those fire in three round bursts, Ben. Like, you, you seriously couldn't do even the most basic of research about this? So yeah, then the men drag Ellen out of the car, and they don't kill her. Instead, they just say, Hey, tell the governor to get his men off the border and let us through, blah blah blah, you know, that kind of shit. And I feel like you could have just killed her, and that would have sent an even better message, especially because now she, like, saw your faces and stuff, but... Okay, whatever. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about this sequence, because it's another part where Ben can control everything he wants, but he still winds up making it seem nonsensical and stupid, because, like it said, the only real thing it mentions is that unaccompanied minors are not getting deported. It doesn't say anything else about it. And it says that, apparently, the number of 
illegal border crossings has jumped up significantly recently, which doesn't make sense because, as he said earlier, the U.S. is in a huge economic spiral. Like, it's going to complete shit. And at one point it mentions that the employment unemployment rate is about 25%, which is huge. That means that that's the worst it's been in, like, 80 years. So why are they all coming across the border? It's certainly not for economic opportunities. In fact, that's actually a proven fact that fewer immigrants come in during times of economic downturn and more come in when the economy is on the upswing and less come in when Mexico's economy is on the upswing or when other countries where they come from, their economy is on the upswing. So it really doesn't make sense from that regard. So maybe they're just fleeing violence. And in that case, well, it seems needlessly cruel to not let them in at that point. And all I'm going to say on that is that if people were fleeing war from Mexico, I'm sure Ben would say, no, don't let them in. But if they were fleeing from, let's say, the Holocaust or the Holodomor, I get the feeling he would feel differently about that, and it's not hard to guess why. So, I'm almost 40 minutes into filming this, and I'm, like, barely a page and a half into my notes, and I have, like, six pages, so... Uh, we might have to go into <laughs> overdrive for this, and I'm gonna have to skip over a lot of little things that I want to talk about, but... You know what, other people have read through this as well, and honestly, like, I was able to get it free from my library, so just check it out yourself if you're really that curious. But, basically, next we go to Brett, back in Afghanistan, and he manages to not die. He has a broken arm, by the way, which kind of... After this opening sequence, they mention that it's broken a couple more times, but it never seems to bother him, so... It, they really didn't need to put that in there, but anyways. Uh, he has a broken arm now, and he manages to get to... Uh, an aircraft hangar, and he finds the dead body of the American ambassador, which got away a while ago, and at first, he's fucking happy about it. And it's only a small thing, and he's only happy about it for a brief second, because, you know, dude's an asshole, but at the same time, like, you're happy that you failed in your mission, and you're happy that the Taliban killed somebody just because you disagree with them politically. And... You see a lot of that throughout this book, really. So, I just felt the need to bring that up. But anyways, uh, he finds the dude's briefcase, and he opens it up by guessing a stupidly basic uh, combination. And then uh, there's a bunch of coordinates in there, and apparently, one of the coordinates is in Iraq. Brett knew what it meant. Brett had known of, of the CIA's discovery of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq for years. Everyone on the inside had known. The media had reported that the government had lied, that somehow all the world's greatest intelligence agencies had been dead wrong. But that wasn't the case. Hussein had smuggled some of the weapons out of the country to Syria. Others had been buried in the desert, beneath those coordinates. And now they were in Iran. Thanks to Ambassador Beauregard Frederick Feldkopf. Feldkopf, you son of a bitch, Brett muttered. You sold us out. Then he passed out. So, a couple of things. One... This is just fucking real-life fanfiction at this point, okay? Iraq didn't have WMDs. Sorry, Ben. You know, it was, it was a stupid war. Didn't work out well. Trying to justify it, uh, what was it, 2016? So trying to justify it 13 years after the fact just makes you look like a petulant child. Well, more so than storming out of interviews when you get asked difficult questions, at least. And also, again... This guy who he disagreed with politically was obviously in league with the enemy. Which just really goes to show how much of a fucking ideologue Shapiro really is. Because at the end of the day, this isn't a work of fiction. This is Shapiro's propaganda. So it goes back to Prescott. It has a bunch of high, mighty, political-sounding dialogue with him and another character. And then he's talking to the governor of Texas. You could send me some troops to the border is what you could do. I'm sure you saw in the news about my staffer. Prescott kicked off his shoes, put his feet on the desk. Yes, sir, I sure did. He found himself accidentally blurring into a drawl of his own when he talked with the rednecks. Tragic, just tragic. Not sure what anybody could have done about it. You could have done something about it. You still can. It's an act of war. It's not an act of war, Governor, if it's not by a foreign government. A pause, then the storm. Horseshit, Mr. President. You know as well as I do that the Mexican government is run by the cartels. Now, that's another really dumb line, because 
While I'm not going to pretend the Mexican government isn't super corrupt, because it is, and I'm not going to pretend that the cartels don't pay people off a lot, trying to say that it's run by the cartels is stupid, because it still does plenty of actions against them, and trying to say... It, like, you're describing the cartels as though they're one entity. They're not. They're a bunch of different political... or not political. A bunch of different criminal organizations. Well, the lines between the two can be blurred. But anyways, a bunch of different criminal organizations that all fucking hate each other, and fight each other all the time, and do horrible shit to each other, because they're all fighting for a slice of the exact same pie. They're not one entity, and pretending that they are is... like, just a complete misunderstanding of everything. So then we go back to Ellen in Texas, and she's about to enter the Capitol building. When she arrived at the Capitol, she made straight for the governor's office. The halls were thronged with angry Texans, and angry Texans were anything but subtle. Some carried signs tacked to wooden planks. Close the border! Enough is enough! Protect your people! She edged her way past one burly linebacker of a man, w wearing a cowboy hat and a gun, which was perfectly legal in the state. That was reason enough for Ellen to love the Lone Star State. There wouldn't be any random shootings, shootings in this Capitol building anytime soon, even if the media made it seem as though every civilian with a gun represented a threat to public safety. Okay, again, treating the media as though it's one entity, when it clearly isn't, and two, I'm not against guns at all. In fact, I think that's one of the very few areas where Shapiro and I will agree politically. I think guns are cool, and I think they have their uses. But the idea that a normal person would stop a mass shooting is kind of dumb, because if you're in a crowd and you just hear gunshots and you just start shooting at the people you think are doing it, suddenly you're going to have 18 people all shooting each other rather than just one or two. And look, I don't wish that was the way things are, but that's how people act. We're dumb in crowds. She showed the guards her ID, and they waved her through. Two knocks on the door, and she stood across from one-time Republican presidential candidate and four-time governor, Bubba Davis. After a stint in Vietnam back in the late 1960s, Davis, a big bear of a man, burly and fun-loving, had come home without a job. So, it basically explains Bubba's backstory there, where he was just a successful businessman who got a loan from his father-in-law. I'm sure that had nothing to do with it. Um, but, and then he, you know, became part of the Texas state legislature, and then he himself became the uh, governor of Texas. But what I find interesting about this is that he's clearly the good guy here, okay? Like, this entire book he's shown to be in the right and, you know, in a difficult position but doing his best. But, you know, he was a businessman who just decided to get into politics. And remember earlier how it said Prescott was handpicked by the power brokers? Who does Ben think the power brokers are? And then it brings up a bunch of bullshit about how, like, environmentalists are lobbying against oil fracking and shit, and apparently they're also funded by the Saudi governments. It's a good thing that oil companies never, ever lobby. So then it goes back to Soledad in her, you know, weird siege thing, and basically a SWAT guy breaks into her house and says, hey, I'm defecting, he basically just says that in as many words, uh, I want to help you escape, blah, blah, blah. And then, uh, as they're leaving, some gunshots get fired, and the militia and the SWAT team starts fighting. In the distance, the cavalry was coming. Soledad's soldiers, at least a dozen bearded, gun-toting men on their steel horses, riding directly towards the SWAT lines. She could see it in the distance. Pickett's hog charge. Sorry, just looking for an excuse to read that line. Uh, basically, she just escapes, and it's really dumb and boring. So it goes back to Levon in Detroit, and again, it reiterates that the only evidence of the police shooting is that he killed a kid, and the only footage shows that he was not justified in doing it. Okay, and then it goes into a bunch of stuff about how the history of Detroit and how it got to this, and how apparently staffing up the police department is controversial, and so they weren't able to hire more officers, whatever. And then we go to Muhammad in Tehran, Iran. Today's attack has ensured that the crippled and weakened infidel giant that was the United States will never rise again. The emptiness and degradation of that perverse country has been wiped away, and the glorious reign of Allah has begun. Those that rejected Allah followed vanities, and Allah has destroyed them. And it goes on for a while like that. It's actually a different guy, uh, Ashimi, or Ashami, sorry, uh, who's just, you know, he's doing his bad guy monologue, and it's just trying to fill in as many buzzwords as possible. It's really dumb. 
And then Muhammad is like this 17-year-old kid that's working for him, and he's, you know, hiding out, in, or not hiding out, really, but uh, he's going to a Western cafe to meet up with someone, and he just wished that Andre would show up already. Even if this was a safe spot, he was getting sick of listening to the Western-style sinful music blaring over the speakers. What, he asked himself, does it mean to hit me, baby, one more time? And, you know, that line is genuinely funny. I'll, 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 give, I'll give one point in Shapiro's favor. That's, that, that's a funny, funny line. So then we learn that Ashami has actually captured Brett and is currently interrogating him about, you know, various info. You know, he's a U.S. general, so he's a very valuable source. And then... Uh, Brett talks him, he talks to him and he says, you're a piece of shit because you kill women and children, despite earlier bitching about how he was not allowed to kill women and children. It's almost like he thinks the rules are for other people and not for him. The rules don't apply to America. That's a very common theme in this book, actually. So then we go to part two, Collapse, and this is just after the terrorist attack at the bridge that was at the prologue. And it doesn't really do a great job of explaining that, okay, yeah, this is after it, because this book doesn't have a good timeline in general. It, I don't know if it happens over the course of months or just a couple of weeks, but it's confusing. So they do that, you know, hostage video thing with Brett, and he sends a Morse code message by blinking and asks them to send in an airstrike. But the president decides not to send in an airstrike because, you know, that could kill a lot of innocent people and start a war with Iran. And Iran is, you know, a sovereign nation that has control over its own territory. Which, I feel like that's something that Ben should understand because he's making such a big deal about the American border needing to be closed. Why does that not apply to other people? Oh, right. They're not Americans. They're not special. But, you know, anyways, uh, they send in and you know, like a spy special ops team to save him, whatever you would call that. And here's that. They crept down the hallway, visibility no greater than ten feet ahead. To the sides ran door after door. A light flashed on behind one of the doors. An old woman suddenly thrust it open. One of the operatives sprang forward, grabbing the handle and easing it shut. Police, he bellowed in Farsi, hoping the rest of the apartment dwellers could hear him. Stay in your home. She nodded, terrified, and let the lock click home. In Tehran, questioning the police would have been foolhardy. Now, I find that interesting because, again, he's admitting that the police can be corrupt and overly violent, but only other people's police. Like, if black people in America are complaining about police brutality, then, oh no, that's not real, they're just being whiny. But other people doing it, suddenly, it's different. So basically, Brett gets rescued and he's actually kind of pissed off about being rescued. He's like, you should have just killed him, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, it goes back to Ellen, and she's happy about her husband coming home, obviously. But then, uh, as she's talking to Bubba, the governor of Texas, he's talking about how he's refusing to send the National Guard to help in New York. There's another river with dead kids in it, Bubba, Ellen said. He shot her a hard look. You think I don't know that? I've seen the footage, too. I'm damn sorry about it, but I'm not the governor of New York. I'm governor of the Republic of Texas, and my first duty is to this state. We give up these troops, we might as well let Prescott open the border officially to the cartels and smugglers. They're the only thing standing between us and a full-scale invasion. Again, kids coming through isn't an invasion, and criminal organizations, as bad as they are, aren't an invasion either. They're just criminal organizations. We, we have those in America, too. And then Ellen is, like, watching the footage of the cleanup after the disaster, and it says, She glanced at the television. The rescue crew was pulling another body from the water, a young girl wearing a Disneyland sweatshirt. It was footage Ellen knew from 9-11 that they'd only show today during live coverage. Then the psychiatrist would explain to the network brass that showing such images was triggering, and the pictures would disappear to spare the sensitivities of the American viewer. Okay, um, seeing dead bodies is something that you're right to be upset about, and that's something that gives first responders and military veterans post-traumatic stress disorder. And that feels like a proper time to be triggered by something and not like, you know, the mocking way that people like to say on the internet. But just, Jesus Christ, dude. Like, can you go any time at all having empathy for your fellow human beings? Like, like at all? Seeing dead children, you just, eh. 
Like, fuck you. So we go to Soledad, she has fled to North Dakota, and her and Aiden are hanging out, and they want to go to Detroit because there's a bunch of, like, protests and, I mean, basically riots, you know, they're, they're getting to at this point. And apparently Aiden knows O'Sullivan, the cop that murdered a child, and he wants to go rescue him. And that's, uh, I mean, that's kind of it. And, uh, well, Sully Dodd also insists that she's not a terrorist a couple more times, so there's that. The only thing that's really interesting in this chapter is at the end, when Sully Dodd is talking to one of the militiamen. I always say the best defense is a good off offense. So does Klobitz. When your force is small, concentrate it and hit them where they're weak. Who are they? The same people who shut down your farm. The same people who attacked you. Those people are Americans. It isn't American to do those things. America means more than being born here. It means believing certain things. And I find that fascinating because that is Shapiro just straight up saying right out to us that people he disagrees with are not real Americans. And he has a history of saying this kind of shit because he said that Jews who vote for Democrats aren't real Jews. So he literally thinks the rest of us are subhuman and can be killed. So then we go back to Detroit, and uh, Big Jim, the black leader I mentioned earlier, says that the police have a history of racial violence and racial prejudice. And that's another thing that somebody says, which is totally reasonable, but it's painted as him being a crazy person. It's just, it's just really dumb. And anyways, uh, O'Sullivan, the cop, gets off, uh, even though footage shows his guilt. It's like the prosecutors are saying, no, no because reasons. Like, she doesn't even give a reason for it, really. She's just like, this isn't murder or manslaughter. It's, yeah, he's fine. And, uh, it's like Ben is accidentally showing off how corrupt police and prosecutors are. So then it goes to Brett, and he's looking for Muhammad, the kid that, uh, was with Ashami, and who he actually saw when he was, uh, captive. And he's going to, you know, an airport and asking for records. And he's saying, yeah, Yes, I'm looking for an Arabic young man. The official hemmed and hawed. I'm uncomfortable with that, sir. That's racial profiling. And I'm like, no, it fucking isn't. Okay, like, at that point, you're just being descriptive. Okay, like, you're saying, yes, I'm looking for a young man, this age, this height, this race. Like, that, that's just being descriptive. Ben just seems to think that anyone who mentions race at all is being overly sensitive and PC. Like, fuck off, dude. So then Prescott... President Prescott is giving a speech at the site where the terrorist attack happened. There's a protester, but he calms her down, and he tells everybody, like, look, we need love, okay? You need to love each other. We can't be angry or hating each other. We need to find the people who did this, yes, but we also need to rebuild and come together as Americans. And that's another thing which is fairly reasonable, but painted as a crazy person saying it. Okay, whatever. And then it goes back to Ellen and Bubba Davis, and it's talking about how... The media, day after day, ran with the story. A president calling for love and unity, and a southern secessionist governor looking like George Wallace. Never mind that David had stood with the marchers of the civil rights era. No, you fucking didn't. Okay, I'm, I'm just saying that right now. No, you fucking didn't. You did not. You're a fucking liar. Stop. And it's interesting to say that because at the time that that was happening, they were viewed as a bunch of rabble-rousers by large portions of the country, but it's only through decades later that we see them as, like, oh, okay, yeah, those are good people fighting for their rights. And I just wonder what Shapiro thinks of Black Lives Matter. I don't have to wonder. I already know. And then Bubba decides to send Ellen to New York, but he says this. You're competent. Your husband is a well-known military figure. And, well, damn it, you're a woman. And those sexists in the press won't label a woman an insurrectionist. Despite the fact that a huge portion of this story is focused on Soledad, a woman who the press has called, uh, rightfully so, a terrorist and an insurrectionist. It's like, can you even keep your own logic straight, dude? I'm sorry, I, I don't want this to be, like, just a political thing. I want this to be, like, laughing at how dumb this book is, but, like, for fuck's sake. So then, uh, a National Guardsman gets beheaded by the cartels, and they send his head in, and... <coughs> well, it's apparently Lieutenant Jeff Jeffords, but, like, we've never met him before this, and we don't see him after, and, like, so it's just impossible to care that this happened to this guy. And then, uh, Bubba decides that he's gonna send the, uh, cartels into Mexico, 
and that he's going to have them just, or not send the cartel, send the National Guard into Mexico and have them blow up a bunch of cartel shit, which is an act of war, because at that point, you're violating Mexico's national sovereignty, you're violating their borders, but it's different because we're American. Nationalism is a hell of a drug. So then it goes to Aiden and Soledad, and Aiden uh, rescues his friend uh, O'Sullivan from jail and keeps him from being killed by rioters, and... I don't know, the, the only reason I bring this up is just because it also needs to take a moment to complain about unions and how apparently his dad lost his job, obviously, because of unions. There's no other reason for it. Whatever. Then we get to part three, the end of the beginning, which is a stupid name. So then Brett continues investigating on his own, but he's also being followed, so he has to lose his tails in order to, you know, be able to investigate properly. And so he's just wandering around the hotel trying to lose him. Instead of exiting at the lobby level, he continued sprinting down into the basement area. He'd planned for this eventuality ever since he arrived at the hotel. In Afghanistan, he'd acquired the useful habit of locating exits and scoping out his location. He knew the maze of hallways and doors in the hotel basement, and he quickly navigated them, waiting long enough to ensure he'd lost his pursuers. When he emerged onto the street, he found himself alone. And just, that's it. That is the most unsatisfying action sequence I have ever read. Like, it's literally just, yeah, I, I lost them because I'm that cool. Like, even with people like James Bond and Batman who are just so cool they never lose, we still know how they did it. So, Brett uh, meets up with his old friend Derek, who got mentioned at the beginning, only now Derek is called Hassan because he converted to Islam at one point. And, um, okay. Uh, and they just... Apparently Hassan is like a an informant in mosques, like he talks about people he thinks are radical and might have terrorist sympathies to the FBI, which, okay, that's fine. And uh, they just mentioned another guy named Anjan Omari, or Anjem Omari, sorry. And he's like just this prominent Muslim imam, and he, you know, talks about how terrorists are bad, but at the same time he mentions how... American occupation of the Middle East and Israeli actions against Palestinians are also bad, and, um... Again, seems, seems totally reasonable. Like, just so many people in here that are just totally reasonable, but Ben is painting them as crazy. So, Brett gets captured, and then he meets up with President Prescott again, which, okay, cool. And then it goes to, uh, the border again, where... Governor Bubba has basically declared war on Mexico, because he's going into their country killing their citizens with military weaponry, but again, it's okay because we're Americans. And uh, it also mentions how there are probably corrupt cops that are on the cartel payroll. Uh, again, acknowledging that cops are corrupt, just not in the ways that is inconvenient to Shapiro. Uh, and then, you know, National Guard kills a bunch of women and kids, but it's okay because reasons. Uh, and then it goes to Soledad, who her and Aiden and O'Sullivan are all hiding out in the woods in Tennessee, and then Aiden gets killed in a drone strike, and the government thinks that she's dead. So, cool. There's that. And then Brett gets away from Prescott, and he goes back to his friend Hassan, slash Derek, and he's dead. Brett knew the apartment wasn't empty. The door would have been closed had the killer had time to leave. They wouldn't want the body discovered too quickly. That would give away too much information. Brett quickly turned towards the bedroom. As he did, he saw a large, black-masked figure out of the corner of his eye. So, Brett kills the guy because he's just that awesome, and then he leaves, and Ellen is in New York now. And she's talking about how there's just so many military people all over the place that she feels safe. With armed men and women everywhere, she didn't feel nervous. She felt reassured. No terrorist would be shooting up a restaurant anywhere near here, and she had to admit she felt safer in Midtown Manhattan than she felt in El Paso, Texas. And then she's trying to find a journalist who is thickly built. So then Brett is talking to the president again, and he says he thinks the bridge is a preliminary attack. Like, he thinks that, oh, they're going to draw in a bunch of people, and then you're going to kill all the ones that come to help as well, which is admittedly similar to what happened in Afghanistan at the beginning, so it's like, hey, there's an actual callback and an actual setup for something, but it doesn't make any sense. Big terrorist attacks are not easy to pull off. They're extremely difficult. That's why we don't have them very often. And so the idea that people could actually plan and successfully pull off two of them is, um, well, it's stupid. 
So Prescott is giving another speech, which is like 80% of what he seems to do in this book, and um, it has him... How do I put this? He has the, quote, most racially diverse troops behind him, so they all show up on camera. And it's clearly shown in this book as a manipulative tactic, which it is, and it is kind of, you know, underhanded. Maybe not underhanded, but like, it's stupid and it tries to give off a false impression. But I just want to point that out because that's the exact same shit Donald Trump does now. And, well, I just don't think that Ben would find it nearly as manipulative. And I know he claims to not like Donald Trump, but uh, he also seems to agree with everything he says ever, so... Eh. So, Soledad actually comes to this event and is in the crowd, and she manages to smuggle in a 3D-printed gun, so it doesn't have any metal on it, and uh, she, you know, is trying to assassinate the president. Like, she's gonna try and get close and do that, and Brett sees her, and this happens. He responded instinctually. Gun! He shouted, grabbing at her hand. Before she could respond, he'd wrested control of it from her, but she managed to pull the trigger, firing uselessly into the air. The crowd around them panicked moving a thousand directions at once, women falling to the ground, men trampled. On the stage, Secret Service agents jumped onto Prescott to protect him, then hustled him off stage as sirens began to wail and screaming broke out en masse. Brett realized he was holding the gun a split second before he felt a large man jump on his back, slam him to the ground. So yeah, Ellen uh, goes on Air Force One with the president and with uh, Omari, the uh, imam that I mentioned earlier, and he is... As they're flying, they're flying, like, you know, right over New York, he is muttering in Arabic, and apparently uh, she finally realizes that Muhammad, the guy from earlier, brought him a bomb. It was the weapon of mass destruction that Iraq made. It's a small nuclear weapon because, you know, that they would totally not have used that if they were being invaded, whatever. Um, but, yeah, uh... Om Omari just straight up stands up, starts chanting in Arabic, holds up a phone like he's gonna blow shit up, and the other passengers looked around uncomfortably, paralyzed by a peculiar in inability to overcome their political correctness. Yeah, that that's it, you know. They're just too PC to racially profile someone. It's not that they're just confused by what's going on, or that they're shocked by what's going on, and people tend to freeze up in difficult circumstances. It's obviously because of that damn political correctness. But at the same time, if you say anything bad about Israel, you're an anti-Semite. So, bomb goes off, Ellen is killed, along with hundreds of thousands of others. And so, we get to the epilogue. Washington, D.C. Good evening, my fellow Americans. The former governor of Michigan looked directly into the camera. She spoke from the East Room of the White House. The tears in her eyes were genuine. She forced them down. I know many of you may not know me. Few Americans bother to learn the name of the Vice President of the United States. But my name is Allison Martin. And... Okay, that, that, that sequence isn't too bad, but, like, <coughs> why did you introduce her as the former governor of Michigan rather than just saying the vice president? Like, that, that's just unnecessary info, and it winds up being kind of confusing. So, so, yeah, this is basically just the new president introducing herself to the world, and the whole epilogue is, like, a bunch of short little things which showing, like, hey, what people are up to now. And, um, apparently a whole bunch of other countries are sending support to the United States, including uh, Russia and China, which, like, just seems dumb, like, that would never ever happen, but whatever. And, you know, the Chinese general is, like, just way too open in his thoughts about how, haha, we're actually going to attack and take shit over, which is, like, I mean, not uncommon in these kind of books when you have a brief moment with the villain and you're in the villain's head for them to just straight up say, haha, I'm evil, but that doesn't make it less stupid. And then it goes to Bubba, and apparently he's like on the verge of being impeached by the uh, Texas legislator, legislature, and it's just, I, I don't know. And at one point he just says, but they wouldn't keep the citizens of Texas safe. Those citizens were Americans, but their rights didn't spring from the federal government. They came from somewhere deeper. Where? Where, where do your rights come from? I, I'm genuinely curious where you think they come from. Like, because people have a lot of different philosophies on this, and you could say something interesting here, but you decided not to, because in your mind, it's just so patently obvious, and anyone who disagrees with you deserves to be shot. So yeah, just uh, Soledad manages to rescue Brett from prison, and then it sequel baits. It just says, yeah, let's go to Texas, and she admits she's a terrorist now, so 
But she also says the government made me a terrorist, so she's not re accepting any sort of responsibility for her own actions. Look, this book is fucking awful, okay? Like, I knew going in that it would be propaganda, but I didn't realize it would be such bad, poorly put together, obvious propaganda. Like, what the shit, dude? One of the reviews I read of this calls it ham-fisted, but like, honestly, even that's giving it way too much credit, because as I was saying, this whole thing is just so transparently hypocritical. Like, America has to play by different rules than other people, and when we do it, it's okay, but when bad guys do it, they're, it's because they're bad. Like, it's just, it's so up its own ass and so circular in its logic that it's not even good propaganda. Like, the people who already believe this shit, like your uncle who shares racist shit on Facebook, would probably love this book, but it's not gonna convince anybody new. So it's just, I don't know. And there, like I said, there's a lot of small things in the prose that I just ignored because I didn't have time for them and they just weren't that big a deal in the grand scheme of things. But overall, it's just a very poorly put together book. Like there's so many different uh, plot lines which don't intersect that well or only come together at the very end and they didn't really need to be there. Like Soledad didn't have anything interesting to do in the book and she didn't have anything important to do until the very end and she probably could have been replaced with another character that was actually with Brett the whole time, or most of the time, and it would have worked better. And the sequel bait ending, hopefully there's never a sequel, <laughs> but if I had to say anything positive about this book, I would say that one or two of the action sequences kind of work, and it's really not that long. You know, like I said, it's a fairly short book, and I, I got done with it in like two days or two and a half days, and the pacing is pretty good too, like, there was no, there were very few sequences, like, uh, that opening flashback sequence with Brett was out of nowhere and stupid, but other than that, there really weren't any sequences that felt unnecessary or dragged on, like, everything was over with pretty quickly, so that's, that is a positive, I'll, I'll give it that, credit where it's due, and at the end of the day, this is kind of a funny book to laugh at and just point out its stupidity and point out its flaws. But even beyond that, I just wanted to give some of you insight into Ben Shapiro because at the end of the day, he's not just a piece of shit, okay? He doesn't just see his political opponents as less than human. He doesn't... he's not just a racist. He's not just homophobic. He's also really fucking dumb. Thanks to everybody who watched this far and thanks especially to my patrons. Uh, thanks to Apo Savalainen, Christopher Hawkins, Joseph Pendergraft, Melanie Austin, you guys, you're, you're great. I, I love you guys and all the other names on here. Uh, if you want to, like, be able to vote in polls to determine what kind of content I make, or if you want to, I don't know, just get early access to my content or other stuff, or just want to support me at all, like, check out my page, please. And if you can't do that, then, you know, subscribe. Rate the video, comment on the video so that it shows up, and I've talked long enough, my throat hurts, bye.